Hi everyone, my name is Bayantina Olga. I am a support scientist at a Joint Institute for LBI ERIC. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about modern interferometers. Uh, I believe that a uh, talk like this should include two questions. What's the interferometer? Uh, like what uh, exactly is these kind of instruments and uh, how do they work? Uh, what we can observe with them and all the questions like this. And the second question is, uh, what's a modern interferometer? Uh, I suppose that uh, to answer this question, we should uh, briefly walk through the history of uh, radio interferometer arrays. Um, so let's start with the first question here. What's the interferometer? Uh, to describe you this one, I would like to start with the question, what's a radio telescope, like a single antenna? Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about radio arrays, so radio wavelengths. Here on this uh, diagram, uh, you can see that uh, radio wavelengths is actually the only uh, part of uh, spectra uh, so where we can we have a nice and pretty wide uh, window uh, to observe the universe. Uh, window with a visible light is much smaller and still affected by atmosphere. Uh, with radio waves, uh, we still have some effect of uh, atmosphere, but they are much more reduced. We still need to build telescopes in the places like deserts and um, where uh, we don't have much rain and uh, stuff like this. But still, you can uh, put radio telescopes basically everywhere. Uh, we have several of them in Europe. We have many of them in, um, uh, in the US, uh, in Asia. So there are no need for particular place, uh, there is no need for it, especially desert. So uh, we have a pretty wide and nice window for radio astronomy. Um, what about the uh, length of uh, this wave length? Uh, they have about the size of a football field, uh, pretty scientific measure, I know, uh, but uh, it describes that uh, we need to have a pretty big uh, receivers for them. And for example, here we have a, a standard uh, scheme of an antenna, radio telescope. Uh, it should have a so-called dish or mirror. Uh, thanks to it, we can uh, receive uh, these wavelengths and uh, mirror them in the secondary reflector out of there they are going to a uh, so-called feed horn. It's a place where we have a receiver uh, thing that are going to receive all the signal uh, focused thanks to the, this giant mirror. Uh, after that, uh, we'll work with the signal. We are going to correlate it. We are going to calibrate it. And at the very end of this chain, we uh, hopefully will have uh, nice images of our target sources. So that's a pretty basic scheme. And uh, really, we have all kinds of radio telescopes. That's just one of them, probably the most popular kind. But we can have uh, simple antennas, something that we have even in our on our cars, on in our homes, uh, one that we use to receive radio and a TV signal sometimes. Uh, so you most probably know all of them, all the kinds. Um, the second question is how many antennas do we need to build an interferometer? Uh, let's start with just one. Uh, is it uh, just one antenna? with one dish, uh, we usually name it single dish. So that's how I'm going to name them uh, in this presentation. Uh, with a single dish, we can really just measure amplitude of uh, our target source. Uh, here we have an example of the graph of, like this. 
Uh, let's go further and have, for example, three antennas. Uh, that's pretty limited interferometer like this, <clears throat> but we have uh, some real examples. For example, it's a Korean VLBI network or quasi VLBI network. This one is a Russian antennas. Um, with minimum of the antennas, we can achieve a uh, phase closure. So it's already kind of the very limited uh, kind of interferometer. We already can observe something, but uh, you will not really get a nice image like here. Uh, uh, still, you can uh, measure some things. For example, uh, there are different baselines that the distances between uh, antennas, and you can check uh, how uh, flux of the target source change with the length of a baseline. Here we have, <coughs> for example, graph like this with amplitudes on different baselines. Uh, real interferometer starts with uh, four antennas because with four antennas we will have both closure of phase and amplitudes. Uh, with uh, uh, enough antennas and uh, long, long time, we can get an image like this. Um, it's uh, going to show us uh, the precise position of the source in space, uh, precise structure of it, uh, of course, based on the uh, resolution of the interferometer. Most of the, most of the time, this small uh, ellipse here uh, are going to show you what the resolution of an interferometer. Uh, this image is just an example. I'm going to uh, tell you about other uh, types of interferometers, like how many antennas really are there. And you will see that most of the time we have much, uh, so, uh, a lot more than just four antennas in them. Uh, here we have a very basic scheme of uh, work of uh, a radio interferometer. For example, here, just for the scheme purposes, we have only two telescopes with uh, some pretty long baseline between them. Um, somewhere up there is our target source and radio waves uh, coming from it. Uh, and we can kind of imagine this front of radio wave. Uh, as we see, one telescope is, let's say, close to it. Uh, so uh, the radio wave achieved first, and then it goes to a second uh, interferometer, second antenna of an interferometer. Uh, at each antenna, we have a, a very nice precise clock, atomic clock. Uh, we needed to have a timestamp at what time we get this signal on this antenna, and at what time we get another signal on this antenna. As you see, uh, when we uh, compare the results, we can see a small gap between these two signals at different telescopes. Um, so if you try to just uh, match them together, you probably will have a noise as a not real signal because, uh, because of this small delay between signals. You need to put them together. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, we uh, record the data from each telescope on a disk. Now it's not magnet disk, that's hard drive, or we just retrieve data through, through the internet. Uh, after this, we uh, go to a correlator, what's uh, basically a huge computer, uh, the ones that can uh, check these delays out of our timestamps and uh, put all the signals together. So we amplify the signal and not uh, just push it forward from each other and uh, getting a noise in the end. Uh, instead, we correlate everything together and uh, we got a nice signal, correlated signal. What's the correlation function? function. We try to find it with the correlator. And as a final step, uh, most probably we are we will get nice images. Uh, it's still going to be a raw data, so you need to uh, convert it in a, some in images yourself. You need to uh, go through all the calibration steps. Uh, 
the one that you are going to learn during this uh, course of lectures. So pay close attention. Um, here I have uh, several links. If you scan these QR codes, you can check uh, several manuals, several uh, collections of lectures on radio astronomy and on uh, radio interferometers in particular. Uh, a bit more about basic terms that we need to know to understand what the interferometer, how do they work. Um, I already said something about the baseline between telescopes, that basically distance between them. Uh, you need to understand that it could be pretty short and pretty small. In this uh, case, these telescopes could be uh, like connected through the wire. Uh, so we basically just uh, send signal from one telescope to another and they all are collected as a correlator. But uh, these telescopes, they could be in the different parts of the Earth. So you can uh, retrieve data through hard drives or through internet, and there is no a real wire between them. Uh, they all act as an individual antenna, and uh, then we retrieve signal from them. Uh, also, we have such a thing as a primary beam. That's basically a field of view of an antenna. Here, just for an example, uh, we let's pretend that this one antenna can see the whole galaxy. Uh, that's field of view of this antenna. It can uh, say us something about uh, amplitudes in, in this uh, field in the space. It's still pretty small, but uh, huge comparing to an interferometer. Uh, here you can see a graph. So we have uh, like a main field of view and uh, several side lobes. Uh, we don't really want to uh, use them, but some part of the signal can leak through them. So we need to know about them, about uh, their directions and uh, how much of signal could leak through them. <clears throat> In the case of interferometer here, uh, I give you an example where we have two uh, pretty far apart standing uh, antennas. Uh, there is a huge baseline between them, but basically with an interferometer, we uh, get a huge telescopes out of several small ones. Uh, and having a huge interferometer like this, we are getting very narrow and small synthesized beam. So if in, with the one antenna we could see the whole uh, galaxy, now we can see only the pretty center of it. Um, it's nice for purposes of imaging the region. Uh, now you can uh, have a pretty precise view on the very small parts of the region. You can understand, for example, if you have a star forming region, what uh, what a particular star, protostar and they you are observing. Uh, before with just one telescope, you will accumulate the whole region in one picture. Now you can distinguish between several sources in the region. And uh, again, if you see a graph for synthesized beam, it's pretty narrow. Um, okay, we discussed uh, how many telescopes, uh, like single telescope do we need. Uh, now we can discuss how big could be an interferometer. Uh, as I said, a uh, main point here there is that uh, many small antennas produce a one huge telescope. Uh, this telescope could be pretty small. Uh, here we have the very large array. And uh, even though the name says that it's a very large array, it's actually pretty compact. And you can uh, coach all the antennas in one of the uh, are, like there are different composition of these arrays. It could be more extended, it could be more compact, but with uh, this kind of configuration, you can see all of them in one picture. Um, they uh, form uh, something similar to a letter Y. Uh, and here again, you can go to the website of the interferometer and check more about it uh, if you're interested in any more details about any of the interference that I'm going to show you today, just scan this QR code, each of them, 
and uh, they will uh, help you to find uh, websites of a particular uh, radio telescope. So uh, we talked a bit about a compact array. Now let's uh, switch to a very long baseline interferometer. That's basically a, a case when we have a particular single dish antenna, but it could work uh, in an array. Uh, we can, uh, several telescopes like for example here, they can observe one uh, target at the same time and then they just send the data to a calculator, and that will get uh, their joint image. Uh, the best example of such an array is the European VLBI network. That's the biggest net, uh, VLBI network that we have at the time. Uh, there are all kinds of the telescopes, as you can see here, from very small to huge telescope like an AFS, like the Fisberg. Um, and again, we have uh, antennas all through Europe, Asia, uh, in, in America or Africa. Um, please check the website to know more. Uh, again, talking about how big our interferometer should be, there are two things. Uh, we have uh, different kinds of baselines. So we should uh, know how far apart uh, several telescopes are staining. For example, here are several examples of so-called UV coverage. Uh, you're going to know more about them in other uh, lectures, so I will not tell much about it here, but it basically shows you uh, what's the resolution of your interferometer. For example, here with just two telescopes and very small time, uh, quick observation, uh, we are going to know something about uh, the source only in one direction. For example, you can resolve it in one direction, but you have no idea about the size or position of the source in other direction, because that's what our pattern is, uh, beam pattern for configuration like this. When, at least when we give uh, at least a bit of time uh, to these two antennas, uh, actually it's a pretty long time because we need to wait for uh, as rotation to help us, uh, then you already can recover something more sensible. You can uh, understand position of the source better. But an uh, ideal case is when we have several antenna, many of them, like here, for example, starting from four, as I said, and you have a pretty long time, pretty long observation time. Then we're already recovering something similar to a real image. Uh, and examples here. Uh, as I said, there are several different kinds of baselines. Uh, we can have long baselines. In, in this sense, uh, it's VLBI baseline. When we have like the whole earth between uh, two antennas, uh, we need them to recover pretty nice and resolved images. Uh, when we want to know about the structure of the source, when we know to, want to know exactly the position of the source. But uh, that's not always what we would like to check. Sometimes we need uh, arrays like a compact array that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and with them, we can recover uh, extended part of emission uh, because uh, there are some uh, events where we uh, interested not only in the precise view on the source, but everything that uh, we have around it. And uh, to illustrate this and maybe explain it better, we have uh, here a nice video. Uh, again, here we have several telescopes, so it's an interferometer. Uh, our target source uh, is going to appear up here in on the screen uh, with a First of all, we will see it as it uh, can see, uh, for example, a single dish. So telescopes with pretty wide field of view. That's kind of a galaxy or nebula or something like this. With interferometer, we already can resolve a jet, like something that we can see here. Uh, we go to a VLBI, so a long baselines, then we go to baselines of the size of about Earth. And 
uh, we can resolve something super small, something uh, at very center of uh, a source. Uh, and for example, here you just uh, seen, you just saw a black uh, black hole that uh, probably all you know, all you know uh, from uh, news. <laughs> but what uh, is a uh, interferometer really is? Uh, basically, if we want to describe it in more understandable words. Um, this array of the telescopes that basically witnesses. They saw something, they have seen something, like uh, they can't describe the whole thing. They uh, don't know all the details. Uh, they are being biased because, you know, we have uh, atmosphere under uh, atmosphere uh, with, and each uh, telescope observe uh, based on the weather around it, like uh, it could be too windy, it could be too rainy, and it's going to affect our data. Uh, then we have a correlator, these computers that put together all the uh, stories from witnesses. Uh, like uh, they can say whatever they want, but we need to put it all together. We need to have these timestamps, we need it to understand a scene as a whole. And at the end of this uh, chain, the very important part of it is an astronomer, where we work here like uh, detectives, because we need to make sense of it. Like correlator, it's super nice computer, but not going to give us any astronomical uh, results. Like it's produced images and we need to do something with them. We need to interpret them. Uh, and uh, we need to understand whether it's, uh, right data like uh, if for example we could have some uh, uh, RFIs or we could have some problems with the data and uh, only an astronomer only a support scientist for example the telescope could check the data and say that something is wrong here probably we need to do all the thing again so all the three steps here in this uh, chain, they are very important. We can say that uh, radio interferometer is only antennas. That's all of them. That's uh, antennas are important, correlator is important, and staff of the telescope and, and uh, astronomers who use an uh, interferometer users are very important. They all create a thing that we know as a radio interferometer. So we talked a bit about uh, the basic things, about technical things. Uh, now let's talk about what's the modern in radio interferometer, why, why we can say that something is uh, so new and modern about it. Uh, the very first thing that I want to show you, uh, I want to kind of compare uh, cameras, uh, photo cameras, and radio telescopes. Uh, I think that they went through the very similar history of development. And uh, as we want to capture what around us with cameras, we want to capture the universe with the, with the, all the, our telescopes. Uh, here you can see one of the first cameras. That's not really the first one. Uh, just, I think, similar to the uh, first radio telescope. Uh, and again, it wasn't really a radio telescope either. Uh, it was an antenna that Karl Chansky uh, built to uh, try to find RFIs that uh, worked against uh, like uh, phone uh, signals that they used in the Bell company. Uh, please check uh, these QR codes. There are very interesting stories behind these pictures. Uh, you probably will learn many new and interesting things. Um, so uh, check them, please. Uh, after that, uh, both cameras and radio telescopes uh, like progressed pretty quickly. Uh, here, like just in the about 20 years, cameras uh, beca uh, became as small as uh, something that we could put in our pocket. Um, and uh, 
radio telescopes, on the other hand, uh, became uh, huge buildings, like the one here, that's a Parks Observatory. Uh, again, you can uh, learn more about it uh, using this uh, link. Uh, and uh, we already started to uh, get pretty nice images with both uh, cameras uh, and uh, telescopes like this. But it, uh, this one, for example, it was still a single dish. Uh, so interferometers, uh, like they're the next step in the progression of radio astronomy. Uh, I think that we can compare them with the film cameras, uh, the one that we used in 90s and something like this. Um, there uh, appeared first uh, radio interferometers, like for example, the very large array. Uh, it uh, was built in the uh, 80s, so the array itself is not that old. So we can say that all the inter radio interferometers that we currently have are modern radio interferometers. <clears throat> this was is compact, as I said. So all the telescopes here, they are uh, connected by the wire. Uh, and what's really interesting, I think, that uh, we have about, uh, now we in the, uh, era of radio astronomy, where uh, we need to do this stuff that uh, photographers uh, used to do in their dark rooms. Uh, like we can't uh, just take a picture and uh, digitally get an image. No, we need to work on the raw data. For, uh, like we have this film roll and we need to do something with it. Uh, at the current state of in the radio astronomy, you really need a professional, like you need a professional astronomer to work with the raw data. Even though our telescopes are pretty good, uh, they're mod as modern as we only can imagine, uh, they produce just raw data and we need some, we need uh, an astronomer who knows how to work with software packages, um, who can calibrate the data and uh, like uh, with all the calibration solution, uh, get nice image. For example, here we have something like that's not really a raw data, that's already some calibration applied, uh, but that's what we want to have at the very end of the calibration process. Uh, so that's really uh, similar to developing of uh, photography. Uh, uh, in this sense, uh, I want to show you a couple of uh, software uh, packages that we use. Most probably you are going to work with them a lot uh, and you definitely are going to work with them during uh, this set of uh, lectures and uh, data reduction sessions. Uh, so if you're interested, just check, in, check them there. It's Apes and CASA. And you definitely need them if you want to work with modern interferometers. Uh, but where are we going <clears throat> and where we partly are now? Uh, for example, with the uh, ALMA, uh, this radio interferometer already can produce images, kind of digital images uh, that are ready to use. Uh, I mean that we observe a target, uh, then uh, data is uh, calibrated, first of all, of course, uh, correlated and then calibrated on the telescope side. And then they uh, produce like ready to use images. Anyone can use them. Of course, you still need to be an astronomer to make uh, like a real scientific uh, uh, conclusions out of uh, this data. But still, uh, that's something that I think we should have in astronomy because uh, if we have uh, ready to use data and we don't need to spend like weeks and months working on the data, calibrating it, then we can use this data in a student projects. We can work with the schools. Um, it's going to be much easier for example, for people who are switching from, I mean, astronomers. Uh, who are switching from one field of research to another, who want, 
who would like to, uh, for example, they work with uh, uh, infrared data and they would like to uh, get some radio data and they don't really know how to work with all these software packages. They don't have this dark room that we have. So uh, they are going to get this uh, ready to use data from Alma, for example, right now, and they can work with it. Uh, it's definitely a direction where we are want to go. And that's something that is very important for modern interferometer. So we talked about all the basic things. So now I'm ready to show you several examples of a particular uh, modern interferometers, uh, the most important ones. Uh, first, for example, as I said, uh, it's Alma. Uh, this one is a rather compact array. As you can see, <clears throat> there, is, there is a core of the array, but you still can capture it in one image. Uh, the telescope uh, consists of a 66 radio telescope uh, and uh, located in uh, Atacama Desert in, the, in Chile. Uh, it's actually a millimeter and submillimeter array. And uh, here with each uh, slide, I'm going to show you two dates uh, because um, these projects, they are mega projects, so you can just build it in a year or even in two. Uh, you need to spend like decades uh, just preparing the project, I mean, science part of it and building antennas and uh, you need to put them in the remote areas like this desert, for example. So there are always several years of building. And when I try to say you that this one was built in this year period, I can just name you a year. I need to uh, give you like uh, at least two dates. Um, the, another one, uh, this one is the most sensitive VLBI array and uh, the biggest VLBI array that we have to date uh, and probably will have will ever have. Uh, that's a European VLBI network. Uh, don't be confused with European part here because even though the core of the array really is located in Europe, uh, we have um, telescopes all around the globe. And for example, as I said, we have several dates here. Uh, yeah, telescopes started to be uh, assembled in uh, 80s, but it's still growing. Like right now, we expect to get uh, several new telescopes. We're expecting to uh, have several telescopes in uh, South America and Africa and Australia. So it's just growing and getting wider. Uh, right now, we have uh, 30 radio telescopes. But again, um, this is not a one solid interferometer. Uh, some telescopes, they come and go. So we have, can have an observation where we use all 30 radio telescopes or we can an observation where we use only 10 of them. It really depends. It depends on weather at each site. It depends on the observation. It depends on the many, many things. So you, you can say what's the core and uh, how many telescopes you are going to get with your observation. Um, so the next one is a, a Mirkat radio telescope. It's located in South Africa. And uh, actually, this is uh, like um, a test ground for a much bigger telescope, a radio interferometer that I'm going to, about one that I'm going to tell you in the next slide. Uh, this one is a pretty new. It just was finished uh, several years ago. Uh, so it produces its uh, very first results. Uh, there are 40, uh, 64 antennas. Uh, and uh, you can check again everything about this new telescope up here in the, on this website. I don't even know um, much about this one. So we still learning and uh, need to propose to the new telescope like this one. So this uh, giant project. Uh, with the Mirkat as a uh, test ground for this one. Uh, it's a square kilometer array and just a planned telescope. We don't have it yet. 
here you can see dates when plan to be built. Uh, there will be many, many antennas, so like uh, thousands of them. And uh, there will be not only single dish antennas, like you can hear here on the horizon, but also antennas like this, just real antennas. <laughs> um, uh, there will be uh, all over the place in Australia and South Africa, so it's going to be a huge thing. Like uh, they're even uh, separated in several uh, sub arrays as a sky lows, SKA mid, and SKA survey. <clears throat> Again, please check this one. There are many plans, so you can participate in them, and uh, you definitely maybe can uh, be involved in them. Try this one. But the most important part of the any modern interferometer is that is the fact that it's actually a collaboration. Uh, that's a mega project. It's always a mega project. So you can't build like an interferometer on your own. There are always many people starting from astronomers, engineers, governments, uh, all the future users. Also, you can't ignore people of a country where you're going to build an interferometer. Uh, so all, all, all of them, like students, many people. Uh, and also there are many institutes. For example, uh, in my presentation, I uh, mentioned only two institute organizations, but there are actually so many more. I tried to put all the uh, logos on this web, on this uh, slide and I just, decided that I will stick with two and tell you that there are so many more. Like uh, there are not only uh, scientific institutes, but uh, so many different things. Like uh, you need to teach students, you need to get money from somewhere, from industries, uh, you need to find engineers and so many more things. So uh, modern interferometer is a collaboration. And you are definitely a part of this collaboration. Uh, you are already on the way to uh, achieving uh, like your place in this collaboration because you try to uh, learn more about calibration of the data, about interferometers themselves. So you are definitely a part of it and you need to work toward uh, creating all these new and modern interferometers. Uh, so thank you, thank you for attention, and please ask me anything if you still have any questions, if you need to find any new data about any of the interferometers, uh, please write to me, and also I'll be uh, one of your tutors during uh, the data, uh, data reduction uh, sessions, so you can write to me in the chat. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. Bye.